attending this particular interview. Firstly, tell us a little bit about your background and the research that you're currently conducting. First, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Hendrik Shaw. I'm uh, the new department chair at the University of Basel, Department of Ophthalmology. Uh, recently at Johns Hopkins, was directing retinal degenerations over at Johns Hopkins at the Wilmar Institute and the director of the Visual Neurophysiology Service at Johns Hopkins. My research interests include uh, retinal dystrophies, so monogenic uh, degenerations of the retina, and that also includes macular dystrophies, uh, such as Stargardt macular dystrophy, one of my favorite topics. Uh, and I'm also working on complex genetic diseases like age-related macular degeneration. So you're familiar with the Labors clinical trial, uh, this, the gene therapy trial for Labors. Are you a uh, principal investigator in that or part of that consortium? I'm actually the coordinating PI of another approach that includes pharmacotherapy right. for essentially the same condition. So uh, that those conditions include RP65, but also another gene called LRAD. So those two genes are uh, genes in the visual cycle, and they would be covered by that medication, would be an oral therapy. Okay. So tell us a little bit more about that oral therapy. Is it a small molecule? It is a small molecule. It was invented by Chris Palczewski. They could already show in the around 2000, 2001, to rescue a phenotype of a mouse model that had RP65-related retinal degeneration. Um, the idea is the following. Um, if the visual cycle is disrupted, uh, the patient cannot produce or recycle the visual pigment in the photoreceptors. That disruption also leads to degeneration of the retina and eventually to blindness, but it uh, mostly leads to dysfunction of the seeing cells. They're not able to produce the seeing pigment. So one approach is to replace the gene, right? Uh, get the healthy gene to the target cells. That is gene therapy. The other approach invented by Chris Palczewski is essentially feed the patient the visual pigment and that will be absorbed as a prodrug and eventually end up in the photoreceptors and makes cells see again they were not able to see before. With respect to constant drug concentrations, as you know, it's a major challenge to get high enough concentrations of a lot of small molecules into the posterior chamber and particularly into the site of, of clinical action. What particular strategies are you using to make sure that you can get therapeutic delivery of your small molecule to the site that makes most impact? It's an excellent question. It's always a challenge in drug development to get the right amount of drug into the target cells. There's a wealth of preclinical development that went into the development of this drug. It's called, was called QLT, uh, 091001. It's now called suretinal acetate. And that, that drug uh, was shown to accumulate in the target tissue, which is photoreceptors and retinal pigment epithelial cells, to a degree that should be by far sufficient to feed the cells with the visual pigment. Still, uh, you never know, and therefore in the phase three clinical trial, there will be a staged approach with a drug increase of, of dose in order to find exactly the right dose that would work in a, in a given individual. So what strategies are you using to actually measure the concentrations? The concentrations are not being measured in the eye. We, we, we can't do that. We can't get access to the target cells uh, uh, in, a living, in a living patient. Uh, PK is being established through uh, serum samples. Are you looking at any other biomarkers as surrogate endpoints? You mean surrogate endpoints as efficacy marker of the sure. therapy? The, I, I must admit the protocol is quite complicated. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a huge protocol. I mean, we are doing groundbreaking research, really. Uh, it's, right. a, it's a rare condition. Um, what the drug is doing is it increases light sensitivity. So most outcome measures are designed to measure more sensitivity of patients after get, they get access, access to the drug. That is full field uh, stimulation of the retina. These are peripheral visual fields. It's also visual acuity at low and high luminances. Are you doing uh, anything with regard to uh, visual evoked potentials? Um, electroretinography. Yeah. 
So the answer is uh, no when it comes to VEPs. Uh, as we know, VEPs are highly reflecting macular function. And in that disease, the disease is mostly affecting the periphery. And therefore, VEP would be a very nice measure, an objective measure to see efficacy, but it would not be an, a good marker in that specific uh, situation. Where are you in the current path for this particular clinical trial? So we concluded a phase 1B clinical trial. First, it was, it was a, a monocenter clinical trial. Later, we did a multicenter phase 1B clinical trial. Uh, and then later on, we did a retreatment trial, the red IDO2 trial. Wow. And that was sufficient evidence to now move into a phase 3 clinical trial, where the first uh, patient should be enrolled this fall. Um, and we have an enrollment phase over the next year or so, so that we should be fully enrolled by next fall, fall and fall 27. How 2017. many centers are involved and how many patients are you recruiting? So the aim is to recruit uh, more than 40 patients into that clinical trial. Sounds like a low number, but we, we're talking about a very rare condition, uh, about 1 in 800,000 uh, prevalence. Uh, so it is clearly an orphan uh, 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 drug designation. Um, and we do that in centers, not only United States, but also in Brazil and in Europe. Is the work in Brazil because there is a cohort or a, a particular area of high prevalence? There is not an, an area uh, in Brazil that would have, as an example, a founder effect or something like that. Uh, it's, it's simply there are excellent centers in Brazil and they have very large catchment areas, and that, that was the reason that prompted that decision. What is your timeline for this particular phase? When do you expect to have sufficient results to report? The, uh, the clinical trial is actually a two-year trial, but the primary endpoint will be reached at year one, which means we should have results by the end of 2018. Does this particular approach have implications for a wider population of individuals with AMD? So, the thing is that in this specific situation, the drug is being tested for mutations in genes that affect the visual cycle. Um, two genes were picked, namely LRAD and RP65, but it would equally apply to other genes in the visual cycle, although they are not included in the trial. So tell us a little bit about some of the other work that you're pursuing in your laboratory. So we have a major interest in, uh, in macular conditions, including Stargardt macular dystrophy. Um, one of the challenges in our field is what are the right outcome measures when we have new uh, compounds, new genes, or even stem cell therapy to measure efficacy. And um, this is uh, a question that prompted a natural history study in Stargard disease that I am leading, the so-called uh, Progression of Stargard Disease Study, or briefly PROCSTAR, funded by the Foundation Fighting Blindness, where we enrolled more than 250 patients around the world in the United States, in the United Kingdom, and Europe. And we see those patients every six months uh, for a period of two years uh, when, and uh, test them for various outcome measures, functional outcome measures, such as uh, visual acuity and uh, microperimetry, uh, but also other outcome measures uh, that are more imaging-based, like fundus autofluorescence and uh, OCT. When you look at the spectrum of studies that you're currently conducting, which of those studies do you expect to report on next? So at AO, I presented a data of the so-called TEAS trial. And the TEAS trial is a phase two multicenter clinical trial in Stargard disease in the United States, uh, where I have the pleasure to be the coordinating PI, although I moved to Switzerland uh, to become the department chair there. And uh, in that clinical trial that aims to enroll 50 patients, we enrolled 41 patients by the end of uh, this week. and. Uh, the primary outcome measure is growth of uh, atrophic lesions. In AMD, we would call those lesions geographic atrophy. In Stargard, we would call them atrophic lesions. Wow. And the compound is an oral compound that is a deuterated form of vitamin A that keeps all biological functions of vitamin A, but reduces A2E in the target cells here, the retinal pigment epithelium. The trial goes on for 18 months, and if we are fully enrolled by the end of this year, we should have data by mid-2018.
uh, 18. If patients are watching this, or patients' families are watching this, and they wish to present their individual as a candidate for clinical trials, yes. Where do they go? Essentially, patients can go to every ophthalmologist to be properly diagnosed, but in order to run such relatively complicated protocols, we need to refer patients to um, centers of excellence that are able to perform all the tests. And typically for, uh, for trials like that, there would be five or six uh, centers in the United States and not more, although clearly more centers would be capable of contributing. Is there a web address or do they go to research.gov? Uh, where do they go to get a, find out more information about referrals? That's an important question. I mean, when you go to uh, clinicaltrials.gov, you find information about the trial. It's very technical in nature on this web page, but it's at least a very comprehensive database of clinical trials. I, I would refer patients to the Foundation Fighting Blindness website, but they can also uh, ask their retinal specialist because at least after they visited AO, they, they would know what are the latest, the latest developments. Switching gears to presenting a message to patients, what in simple language are the implications for patients and their families of this current work that you're doing? We try our best to establish those tests that in the future would allow us to, to test efficacy of new drugs, new genes, and new stem cell therapy approaches to bring therapy to, to the patients. In order to do that, we run several studies to look at complicated protocols, but we also are already in drug trials where patients can uh, expect that such drugs would allow to slow down the progression of disease. When it comes to stem cell therapy, we can be a little bit more ambitious. Maybe we can achieve more than just, although it's already ambitious, uh, slowing down the disease. We may see even improvements, but I anticipate that with stem cell therapy, that will happen further down the road. So these are iPS cells or embryonic cells? Yes. yes. Which are you currently most optimistic about? I showed yesterday uh, uh, data uh, uh, from the Estellas Institute of Regenerative Medicine um, that uh, partnered with Oxford University that used both embryonic stem cell derived cells and, uh, as you mentioned, induced pluripotent stem cells like uh, or iPSC cells and we're able to show that both are equally effective. There are pros and cons for both. Uh, if, if, if I would uh, need to make a choice, I would go for iPSC because you, you uh, um, have uh, less implications that are ethically problematic. At the same time, it is not so trivial to come up with a product out of iPSC because this is, so, so to speak, individualized therapy. Um, again, which has advantages, but for, uh, for uh, commercializing therapy comes with challenges, but these are ex actually challenges that uh, companies need to solve. With respect to embryonic approaches, as you know, the current protocols require a six to eight week course of immunosuppression. Uh, what is the current implication long term for an embryonic approach? Can one stop the immunosuppression uh, and still have reasonable cell survival? What is the emerging data in that regard? Yeah. We have to admit we are still in the beginning. Uh, the data I showed yesterday uh, uh, from landmark studies uh, uh, that were published in the Lancet paper are breakthrough results because they could establish safety. And uh, from those studies, uh, using human embryonic stem cell derived cells that develop into retinal pigment epithelial cells, um, we would conclude that safety is so good that we would not believe that patients would need to be a prolonged period of time on immunosuppression. When it comes to stem cell therapy to replace the seeing cells, the photoreceptors, that may be different, we don't know, I would anticipate the same safety. What about the, you know, the implications? These are subretinal, I would assume, subretinal implantations. Yes. And the, the question always is how much retraining, how much uh, visual cortex retraining is required in an individual that 
particularly children who don't have a, a history of visual stimulation, what are the protocols for essentially visual physiotherapy in these right. patients? I believe we can rely a little bit on mother nature. Uh, we, we learned that from cochlear implants where patients needed to learn to hear again with those implants and it worked surprisingly well, I, I, I should say, uh, mostly because the inner ear may not be as complicated as the retina. So it may make sense in the future to have patients go through periods of training to relearn seeing, yeah. but I would be optimistic that the uh, quite large potential of the visual cortex could be utilized. What are the new studies that you're planning to embark upon in the next 24 to 48 months? I mean, we discussed uh, quite ambitious research programs already. Um, I think the most uh, uh, exciting developments in our field are indeed on the stem cell and gene therapy side. Um, uh, the data that I showed uh, yesterday on stem cell transplantation would make you optimistic that in the future we may get to a human clinical trial using cells that would allow to restore photoreceptors. Um, but given the uh, time period that you, that you just mentioned, 48 months, that may be slightly unrealistic. Well, that really is the, the final question. Patients always walk into your office, my office, and they say, when can we expect? What is the timeline? Uh, but given your trajectory, given your path, what do you uh, recommend we tell patients in that regard? So I would like to combine it with uh, uh, a recommendation. And the recommendation for patients is they should get proper diagnosis and proper genetic testing. Because we are ramping, ramping up for therapy that may hit the market in less than two years and those therapies will be tailored specifically for specific genes. So only patients that are properly diagnosed and have an established genetic diagnosis would be able to benefit from such therapy. And that may be very similar in Stargardt disease also. We are in phase two, but if we get into phase three and then to market authorization, we would again need to have established a proper diagnosis of Stargardt, and that includes testing the underlying ABCA4 gene. As you know, there are a lot of companies offering genetic testing. How do patients decide and make sure that the right genes are being tested in the right panel? What would you recommend? I have a clear recommendation. They should go through a retinal dystrophy expert and not directly to a genetic lab. Uh, um, the reason is that only then a tailored approach can, can be taken. The retinal specialist would use a CLIA certified lab. And I also need to add that just making the diagnosis is not sufficient. It needs to be explained to the patients. All the implications need to be explained. The risk needs to be explained. The risk for other family members needs to be explained. We call that process genetic counseling, and this would be strongly recommended. Professor, are there any additional points that you'd like to add for our audience? I believe that was very comprehensive, and uh, I myself, I'm, I'm looking forward to the new results, and I believe that my patients are, do that too. Thank you again, Professor. We really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you.